Hi, everybody. Uh, good to be here with you today. I just want to uh, just talk about a few things that have happened since I've been gone. Uh, first, I want to thank Deputy Chief Davis uh, for his leadership and his hard work um, over the last couple of weeks while I've been gone. We've had a couple um, challenging situations that he was uh, able to work through and uh, provide good leadership uh, to the organization. I want to uh, just thank him for his efforts uh, publicly first. And to the men and women of the police bureau too, um, who show up every day and serve, do uh, exemplary work. Uh, they've managed through these tough incidents and I just wanted to thank them for their hard work and their efforts as well. Um, you know, I've had a couple questions about my reaction to the Chauvin verdict. And uh, I, personally, I feel that the jury got it right. Um, I've said from the outset, um, how troubling it was to watch that video of uh, George Floyd being killed. And I think, you know, the, we come to this work with a servant's heart and it should be done with compassion. And I think, you know, that that was not what what was displayed there. And I think, you know, even though we, we have a verdict now, um, there's still a sentencing piece. But I just want to highlight that there, there are no winners in this. Um, there's a, a family that's hurting. They've lost a loved one who's not coming back. Um, the city of Minneapolis uh, ripple effects through, you know, everyone from the witnesses to that event um, to people in the city their law enforcement agency and uh, law enforcement agency and people throughout the country um, I really felt the impact of, of what happened to George Floyd. So I just, um, you know, at this point, I think the best we can hope for is that some some positive change will come out of this and uh, keep that happen from happening to someone else. Um, we also had an officer involved shooting here in Portland on the 16th too. And, uh, you know, whenever a life is lost, it's a tragic thing. It impacts a family, community, loved ones, uh, the people within the police bureau and the city. Uh, right now, I can't say a whole bunch on specifics, but there are multiple um, investigations and reviews going on regarding that at the, the DA's office, uh, internal affairs here and our training division. Um, in this instance, we were able to release more information sooner than I think we ever have before. So I'm really happy about that. Um, and I think, you know, for us, it's always a balance of uh, getting information out and the public need versus the integrity of the investigation. So we always try to balance those two things to really try to to meet the public's need and desire to know what happened, but also allow the investigators to do their work and not uh, impede their their job in some way, too. Uh, we've seen some direct action events and we continue to see those throughout the city. Um, that remains a point of frustration for me and a lot of people in the community. Uh, we've seen direct action events that have damaged uh, organizations like churches, uh, Boys and Girls Club, and uh, organizations that do a really, you know, a really good job of serving people in the community, uh, not to mention businesses who are already hurting from the pandemic. So we, we here at Portland Police, we're going to do our best to respond to those. Uh, we've made key arrests. We'll continue to make key arrests in those instances and uh, we'll manage our resources as best we can to respond to them. But uh, when we do respond to them too, there are also people who are victims of other crimes who have to wait uh, to get service while we while we deal with those as well. Uh, May Day's coming up. Uh, May Day traditionally here in Portland has been a day of free speech events, protests, demonstrations. Uh, we're used to that. Uh, we fully support people's right to go out and exercise their free speech. We just ask that they do it in a manner that um, doesn't include destruction and violence or any criminal acts. Um, the district attorney's come out and he's been clear that he will uh, look to prosecute cases where there are uh, people committing crimes like arsons, assaults, and uh, criminal mischief damages to businesses and things of that nature. So we appreciate that. And uh, gun violence, big topic. Uh, it continues to be a real problem here in Portland and the metro area. I know there was a shooting last night in Gresham where several people were injured. Uh, another shooting here in Portland. Um, we have members of our enhanced community safety team who are investigating and helping with those investigations. Uh, it's really, um, it's really for us troubling. We're trying to do everything we can with our resources to uh, put the resources that we have available towards gun violence um, and do it in a way where it doesn't to negatively, negatively impact the other work that we have to do here at the Police Bureau. And 
I think the last thing I want to touch on is uh, traffic fatalities. We've had um, 23, I think was the last number I saw for the year so far. Um, last year, this time we had 13. And uh, last year we had the highest number of traffic fatalities we've had in 30 years. And uh, we're on a pace now to outpace that. So that is, uh, that's troubling. We're doing what, what we can do to put resources towards uh, you know, the safety aspect of traffic enforcement. And uh, I just want to highlight to folks to be mindful on the road. Uh, be careful, watch your speed. Um, be mindful of pedestrians and people crossing and crosswalks and things of that nature. And that's about all I have. I'm going to leave uh, plenty of time for questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, first uh, person in line looks like it's uh, Shane Kavanaugh from the Oregonian. Uh, Shane, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi there, Chief Lavelle. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we're turning up the volume here. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I wanted to ask about on the topic of gun violence, the uh, creation of this upcoming focused intervention team um, was hoping to get a better idea of where things are in that process and when at the earliest do you think the focus intervention team can be on the ground and running? Yeah, that's a good question. We are, we're in the process of figuring out where we're going to get the resources uh, for that team. Um, as you know, our, our request for funding for it uh, did not go through, so we have to take those resources um, internally. So uh, we want to be mindful of how we build that team, though. We want there to be the appropriate amount of community input and things of that nature, too. So the best thing I can tell you is that we realized our urgency in having it up and running as soon as possible, but we want to be really mindful about how we do the selection, who we include in that process, and giving those officers who are going to be doing that important work, all the uh, time, tools, and uh, things they're going to need to be successful. Okay. Uh, Can I ask a follow-up? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, are we looking at weeks here, months? Will the focus intervention team be up and running by the summer, do you think? Or are there still too many unknown factors at this time? No, I think it would be up and running by the summer. Um, it's just a matter of, of figuring out the, the way to do the selections that's really uh, meaningful and includes community and setting it up in a, a way where uh, we kind of avoid some of the pitfalls of our previous efforts around gun violence reduction. Okay, thanks, Shane. Uh, Wright Gazaway, you're up next. Go ahead and unmute. Thanks, Chief, for taking some time. Uh, my question is related to the officer-involved shooting. Uh, I spoke with a witness who said he did not see a gun in Mr. Delgado's hand, and I'm wondering if you've gotten any clarity on what led Officer DeLong to fire at Mr. Delgado. Did did, did he see a gun? Can, have you gotten any clarity on what led to the shooting? I don't. And I can't really talk about specifics of that case. It wouldn't be um, appropriate for me to to comment on that. But um, yeah, no, I I can't I can't give you any more clarity on that. Okay, right. Uh, you have a follow-up question? Yeah, just want to follow. The video that I've seen is, is from a bystander. If there were body camera video, it does seem like that would give a little more clarity to what happened. As the chief, I know it's not entirely your decision, but do you support body cameras, and could that provide more clarity in a situation like this? You know, I'll just tell you from my perspective, I am a fan of body cameras. Um, there's a lot of agencies that have them, and they help them in, in situations like this, and also just... Uh, call taking, uh, even crowd control, public order type events. Um, I see a lot of value in that. Um, I do realize there's a heavy cost to managing those programs, but um, I think you know body cameras are a good tool. Okay, next up, uh, Maxine Bernstein. Go ahead, Max. Thank you, uh, Chief. I, um, the, the family of Mr. Delgado, held a news conference while you were away uh, calling for a special prosecutor to investigate the uh, police shooting. And I wondered if you would, if you support that. You know, that decision is probably will get made um, above me, but I feel like, you know, I don't want my opinion to, to influence that decision. I just feel like, you know, me personally as a leader of an organization, I would never stand in the way of an independent look at an incident or, or the organization, but I want to just, you know, be real mindful about my 
comments and opinions on it. But, you know, if if that were to come to pass, we would uh, cooperate and participate in that investigation as appropriate. Okay, Sarah Hurwitz is next in line. Go ahead, Sarah. Hey, Chief. Thanks so much. Um, sure. So my, my question um, has to do with all of the gun violence efforts right now. So I just wanted to clarify, from what I understand, there are four different teams or like groups that the Bureau has been directed um, like to use or to, to create um, with focusing on the gun violence issue. So I just want to clarify, is it, so we have the Metro Safe Streets Task Force, right? And that's obviously several organizations that are involved. We have the FIT team, we have the ECST, and then we have one other team that was a part of that city agreement. Is that accurate first off? Um, I just wanted to clarify that. Which city agreement? Sorry, um, it was the gun violence agreement uh, that city commissioners uh, had agreed on a, a several weeks ago. Um, this would add six additional assault investigative detectives and one sergeant to coordinate on gun violence related investigations. CST, yeah, my question just really is like, yeah, it's like we have so many different teams mm -hmm. that I'm like, okay, where is this overlap? What like? Is there, obviously there's a main focus with all of this, but it seems like because you're already short staffed, you're pulling all these different things for all these different focuses. So I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, no, I, I hear where you're coming from. Yeah. And you know, for us, we want to make sure we're doing everything possible to stop and reduce gun violence in the city. I mean, it's some of the most important work we can be doing because people are, you know, getting injured and killed. So we want to make sure that we are being as proactive as possible, but we're in a situation too where resources are limited and we're pulling from already strained resources to try to bolster that effort. And uh, you know, we'll have to figure out where the officers for the FIT team will come from. And that's probably gonna impact other important work that um, that really needs to be done in the city too. And I think some of the you know officers from ECST and with the uh, other partnerships that we have going on now, um, being able to pull them to do that gun violence work has impacted some other areas as well. So I, I definitely appreciate your question. And I should probably uh, help clarify, Sarah, that the um, the the officers and investigators that will be part of the Metro Safe Streets Task Force will be from ECST. So those are the same Got it. actual staff. Um, the fit will come from a different pool of resources. Of, of resources, right? Got it. And I know that's confusing. There's a lot <laughs> going on. No, but that's helpful, at least, yeah, to understand where everything's coming from. I do have one follow-up question um, sure. on the in the same vein of just short staffing. And I know you've been talking about this for months now. Are you guys in any active recruitment for officers? I know you've also talked about the process that it takes. It's a long time to get people up and, and running and trained. Um, but I'm curious if the Bureau is in that process at all. Yeah, we had opened up our application for a period of time and uh, we got over 400 people who applied. So that's very uh, positive. There are people who are still interested in doing this work and working for the Portland Police Bureau and serving the Portland community. Um, it is a long process to get that person through application and then through all the steps to where you can actually hire them. But our hope is to be able to hire again soon. It takes, you know, about six months to get someone through the hiring process. And there's an 18 month probation um, after that as well. So your lead time to have a fully uh, functioning, able to work the street by themselves, police officers about two years. So that lead time is, is really important to factor in when you have pockets where you don't or aren't unable to hire. That just kind of stretches, stretches out your timeline. OK. Uh... The next question in line is Amanda, Amanda Arden. Uh, go ahead, Amanda, with your question. Hi, Chief Lavelle. Uh, this is Amanda Arden from Coin News. Um, my question is back related to the Robert Delgado shooting. Um, we're wondering, has Portland Police Bureau considered having the Portland Street response team or any other mental health support responding to incidents like this 
alongside police officers, even when the subject is holding a weapon. You know, I, I'm a believer in co-responder models or even models where, you know, maybe the police aren't the best ones to show up. Um, I think in this case, um, depending on the level of threat, it, it really, you don't want to put people in, a, in harm's way. Um, I think street response, you know, is probably more geared to lower threat type calls. Um, but, uh, you know, we have our behavioral health unit that does a lot of follow up with folks who are experiencing mental health crisis. And uh, we do have a large cadre of enhanced uh, CIT crisis innovation uh, trained officers who, who go on these types of calls. Um, you know, I, I do think there is room for co-responder models, but I think we just have to implement it in a in a safe manner, one that uh, doesn't put people in unnecessary harm. But um you know, I think that's probably a conversation. You know, that's a fire bureau program, but uh, we, we think we have a good working relationship with uh, street response at this point. Okay, uh, uh, back to Shane Kavanaugh. Uh, Shane, if you'd like to ask another question, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Chief. Uh, on, back to the uh, focused intervention team and gun violence reduction. So, uh, for this team of 12 officers and two sergeants, you've mentioned that you'll have to reassign folks from uh, other assignments to fill that. Has the Bureau started doing that process yet? Have you begun looking for those individuals? And where are you at in sort of identifying who might fill out that team? I know we've had some conversations with officers who might be interested. Um, it's, it's interesting because we have you know, we're looking for people who are the rank of officer. So if you have to, you know, fill from a specific rank, you know, that eliminates detectives and sergeants. So you have to look for places where you can spare officers or move officers to do this work. So we haven't really done that yet. And like I said, we really want to be mindful in its creation. We really want to have the, the right community involvement in the selection process as well. So it, it hasn't uh, started yet in that regard, but we, we have, um, we have started to kind of figure out who and how many might be interested in doing this work again. And one follow up on that, Chief. I mean, what have officers, it's, it sounds like you have started putting out your feelers a little bit. I mean, what has been sort of the response from your, your rank and file officers about, uh, are there sufficient number of people interested in filling this role? Uh, do you feel like you'll be able to get volunteers or where you have to actually get uh, people in, onto this team who might not have put their hands up to begin with? No, I'm, I'm confident we'll have enough volunteers to, to field this team. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is difficult work. Now, I think this work is probably more dangerous than it's ever been. Um, there's a lot of guns on the street. There's a lot of shootings. And uh, like I said, we want to be really mindful of who we select, but we also want to give folks the opportunity to be successful. And if we have uh, for instance, you know, officers who haven't done this type of work before, we want to make sure we give them some time to work together to have, uh, you know, make sure they they have their equity training and all these other things um, done prior to doing this work. So they, they're set up to do this work in, the, in a fashion that's going to be consistent with what the community expects. All right, uh, back to Wright Gathaway. Go ahead, Wright, with your next question. I want to stick on that uh, fit, uh, the folks intervention team. For someone who might not understand policing, can you just explain how that work would be different than what a regular patrol officer does? I mean, are regular patrol officers only answering 911 calls? Are they not doing any proactive work? How would that work look different than, than what your patrol officers are doing right now? Well, that work would be focused uh, more on gun violence. So, you know, right now officers respond to calls for service and there's a variety of calls that, that could come in. These officers would be more focused on gun violence and gun related calls. And um, I think that's really the big um, discern. And I think, you know, there, there would be opportunities for these officers to work closely with some of our other partners in DCJ, Department of Criminal Justice, uh, or Community Justice, uh, Parole and Probation, some of our other partners at the county and things of that nature. So it'd be just a more focused effort on gun violence. Okay, uh, Max, can, can I just one follow up on that? Oh, sure, go ahead. But but if they weren't, say, responding to a shooting scene, they would just be going back to patrol, or would these officers not be doing patrol at, at all? I'm just trying to figure out what role they would have. Uh, they would be 
able to cover on calls and do other things. Their main focus would be gun violence type work, but they would be in a patrol car, you know, mobile in the city. So, I mean, they would be uh, able to, to respond to, you know, things that they felt that they needed to go to, like to cover another officer on a call or something like that. Uh, all right, uh, Max Bernstein, uh, you're up, go ahead. Yeah, just following up on the fit. Uh, so the last time you had the press availability, you also said then you weren't sure where these officers would come from. I think that was about a week and a half or so ago. I just wondered what's been done in the interim and also what the process is for this community oversight group for the FIT team. Who, who's putting that together? How is that, uh, how's it being determined? Who's gonna sit on that, et cetera? Yeah, no, that's a fair question. Uh, for us, we're, we're not really involved necessarily in the process. I think we've been working really closely with the mayor's office. I think the mayor's office has been working with um, other city commissioners. And then once this group is identified who will participate, I think we'll have um, a fair amount of interaction with them. I think one of the things that were miss was missing in some of our previous attempts at gun violence reduction is it didn't really have um, the transparency. There wasn't really a lot of understanding on how that work was being done, who was doing the work, what that work really looked like. Um, a lot of that story was told in stops data and numbers and uh, the amount of guns taken off the street. But I think that that's just a, a quantitative story. I think the qualitative story is really the one that's important when it comes to that work. And I think having the uh, community oversight piece and the interaction with them, being able to meet with them, talk with them about the work, let them understand uh, kind of what's happening and who's doing the work is gonna be really important to its success. Okay, I uh, will get a few more questions in before uh, our time run, runs out. So Tess Risky, you're up with your question. Hi, Chief. Um, I just wanted to check in on the situation with Officer Hunziker. Um, I wanted to ask, um, is that investigation still ongoing? Is Officer Hunziker still working patrol in the East Precinct? And do you personally know what exactly led to his resignation last month? I don't. I do know that is uh, currently still ongoing. Um, it is with our uh, internal affairs. And I think, you know, right now there's 60 something investigations that they're doing that they're assigned to eight investigators. So they have a pretty heavy workload, but uh, I haven't had any update on that one since my time back uh, yesterday. But I do know that investigation is still currently ongoing. And I think until we're able to really get uh, some interviews and some more clarity, I, I won't know exactly specifically why he resigned other than what he made in his uh, what he stated in his initial comments when he resigned. Okay, thanks for the question. Amanda Arden, go ahead. Hey Chief, again, um, wondering, uh, has the Enhanced Community Safety Team knowingly prevented any shootings from occurring since it started last month? Huh, it's hard to say if they prevented any shootings. I know they've done a lot of good investigative work. I think they made an arrest uh, yesterday on uh, a suspect from a shooting in the Brentwood Darlington area. Um, there's a lot of good investigative work that's being done, but it's hard to to say definitively that they've prevented something from happening. But I, I, I believe in my heart of hearts that their work is contributing to prevention of shootings. Okay, uh, and then uh, probably do two more questions. So right, uh, Gazaway, go ahead with your last question. Chief, that shooting last night in Gresham, I know it wasn't in Portland, but only by a handful of blocks. It seems like there have been several shootings at vigils like that. Uh, have you had conversations with the, the chief or officers in Gresham about that? Are you concerned about these shootings that have happened at vigils and, and what can be done uh, to prevent those? Are, are you willing to patrol them or to, to provide security for these families that want vigils? Yeah, we've done that in the past. I know uh, we work closely with uh, the Office of Violence Prevention and some other outreach uh, workers here in Portland. And we've, we've provided officers for vigils and for funerals uh, when resources were permitting. But I think it's really important to do that work for just for the community safety and the peace of mind aspect. I believe we did send officers to Gresham last night to assist them. 
Um, not sure if they all went to the scene or if they were taking calls uh, to allow Gresham to investigate and do what they needed to at the scene. But that's something that we do on a regular basis, and I think it's important. And anytime there's a shooting or a gathering where people could potentially be in harm's way, I think it's definitely something that uh, law enforcement should be aware of or concerned about. Okay, our last question is uh, Jonathan Levinson. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, hey, Chief. Um, do you think it's problematic at all that an officer who made, this is uh, Hunziker, who made such a serious mistake that he felt he had to resign from his position as union president, that that, that officer is still working and you don't know why? You don't know the, the details? That seems like a might be a problem for you. You know, I think we have a process set up to figure all that out. And, uh, you know, I think whatever happened with him was, you know, he serves two different roles as union president, but also a, a police officer within the organization. So, um, you know, the, the, the union piece too, I think it's important for people to know that those activities are, are separate in some way and protected um, from the police bureau as well. There's a, a, a reason to have those two with a bright line between the two. Um, so I'm confident we'll find out exactly what happened as our investigation progresses, and then we'll make the decisions uh, necessary once we have the information. But a quick follow-up. You know, he's, he said that his mistake was in relation to an investigation, and he is still in a position with access to, uh, you know, investigative material and confidential material. That doesn't concern you? Um, like I said, I think, you know, we'll find out what we need to know during the course of the investigation. Um, we do look at these on the front end to see if there's a reason for someone to be uh, able to still work versus off on admin leave or things of that nature. And I think in this case, uh, we're comfortable having him continue his duties as a, an officer until the investigation is complete. Okay, uh, that is the time we have. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end it here. Uh, thank you again all.